breaks the power of sin and darkness. Whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. Tested more than I could bear 
Listen now, help me, Lord. Now help me, Lord, to share what I've been given. Help me make a difference with the life I've been. As I show my name for which your treasure store. Help me know you promise you'd be with me, Lord. Good morning, church. My name is Gabe Strobel, and this is my beautiful pregnant wife of 25 weeks, Nirvana Strobel, and we just both wanted to welcome you all to the virtual Sunday service. As many of you know, um, last Thursday, early Thursday morning, our dear Risa Ennis passed away from her long battle against cancer. I'm sure a lot of you knew Risa and deeply loved her, um, and maybe some of you I uh, may have never had the chance to meet her, um, but we actually met Eric and Risa when we got engaged. They did our premarital counseling about six years ago, and uh, since then have just built a really awesome friendship with them. And um, the past uh, about eight months or so, we've had the opportunity to meet with Eric and Risa in their home, um, just to pray and read the Bible and spend time with each other and sometimes we laughed sometimes we cried and I think it was a really really special time but um, some things I'd like to share about Risa is just how joyful she was um, how much she loved God and how she just really left an impression on people whenever she met them and we know that that's who she was uh, till the very end yeah, and we know that we're going to really miss Risa a lot. Uh, Nirvana and I personally feel that a lot, and we know a lot of you will feel that. And although we're going to really miss her, we also know that she left an incredible impact on Earth. Like her faith, her courage, um, just her spirit uh, was left as an impression on so many of us. And as much as is you know it's sad to to see her gone i know that she is not suffering anymore um she's kind of freed herself of this body and i know that she was in a lot of pain and she's in heaven and um and and this is a time for us to really uh rejoice and be grateful for her life and we really want to ask all of you to keep eric and his family and her family uh in your prayers uh we will also send out some details following about the memorial service. Uh, so let's go ahead and pray for the service and pray that um, that we can have a great time of worshiping God together. Uh, it's something that she loved to do and it's something that we all love to do together. And uh, so let's go ahead and with the service. Dear God, thank you so much uh, for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity just to be able to um, have union through your spirit. Uh, just have the opportunity to share the same spirit as you. And and God, we're going to really miss uh, Risa. We're going to really miss uh, the joy that we she had, the light that she had. But God, she was just such a great example of what it is to follow you, of what it is to know you, of, of what it's like just to be impacted by you, God, in your scriptures. And I really do pray for her spirit. I pray that she is just so excited to be in, in heaven, like, free of pain, free of suffering, like super excited and super happy. And I do pray for Eric. I pray for his transition. And just in this time, I pray for their family. And I pray that you comfort them and love them and give to them. And, and God, I pray as a church that we can surround them and love them as well. 
I pray for the rest of service. I pray that our hearts and minds would be focused on you and our love for you would be um, shown. I love you in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The next two songs we're going to sing are, are newer songs for us. This one's entitled Here Again, just reminding us of the faithfulness of God, that God is here in this place as we worship. Let's sing. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the is the place where you promised to be and I'm not enough unless you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you
next song we're going to sing is called Sea Victory. part we're going to sing out is just kind of an anthem that God is able to take anything, even what the enemy means for evil, and turn it for good. Sing. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Give Bosworth here to to spend a minute to remind us why we celebrate Memorial Day weekend. Beyond the barbecues and the times with family and friends, it is a time of remembrance. And this Monday is a very special Memorial Day as it will be the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Please take some time to pray, reflect, and encourage a veteran and thank them for their service and for their families. We pray that you have a great day and remember freedom is not free as we know. And thank goodness Jesus gave his life for us. We love you. Have a great day. I really want to thank those uh, who have served in the military in the past, those who continue to serve. And uh, we also want to really just remember, and that's what the Memorial Day is really about, is remember those who... Uh, who paid the ultimate price and uh, we are grateful for their service and uh, grateful that we have freedom because they were willing to sacrifice for us. So today as we uh, prepare for our lesson we're going to talk about someone else who was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice and her name is Esther. So we're beginning a series today called For Such a Time as This. You know, today's lesson is entitled, The Silent Sovereignty of God. You know, when you uh, look at this and when you uh, study out this book, you, you find out a lot of different things that maybe you didn't know before. And so I hope today as we dig into God's word, he will open up your eyes to see wonderful things in his word. So let's go ahead and pray and let's get into it. Father, I want to thank you, God. It's uh, encouraging to be together. Encouraging to be able to open up your word, to begin a new sermon series, God, to uh, focus on what an amazing God you are. And I'm so grateful for your silent sovereignty working in every situation in our life. Uh, going back to those days in history throughout the Bible, God, even in our own day today, and we know that you are in control of all things, and we're grateful that we can put our trust in you and be still and know that you are God. I love you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Esther is an amazing book. It has drama, power, romance, intrigue. It has all the, the makings of a best-selling thriller book, and yet we get a chance to read it in the Bible, and so it's really, really encouraging. Uh, really, the, the book of Esther gives us a front row seat to watch God's people as they were sent into Assyrian captivity and how they handled that time and how they functioned in that environment. You know, the story kicks off in King Xerxes' palace and he's hosting a party. Now, Xerxes was, was the most powerful man alive at that time. He was, uh, he was a feared leader. He was an amazing king in the eyes of everybody. There was no one more powerful than him. In fact, he had a security team. You may have heard of them. They were known as the Immortals. It was 10,000 men built and chiseled, uh, kind of like uh, Noah Moore, uh, only more than Noah. And so it's, uh, it's really encouraging to, to, uh, to understand kind of what's happening here as we dig into the scriptures and to see how God works in these different situations. But I think sometimes people think that maybe God isn't working. And, and so we're going to see some of that in the story. In uh, chapter 1, in verse 1 through 3, we read in Esther 1, it says, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. And so we see that he had this massive responsibility, 127 provinces, approximately the area of the entire United States. Historians suggest that he had 15,000 men working as his nobles and his officials. And so what's happening now is he's about to, uh, he's getting ready to host a party. And apparently these potentially 15,000 men are in his palace. So you can imagine this is an amazing, opulent palace. It is 
maybe one of the wonders of, of people as they walk in and go, whoa, what is this? And, and we, they give some more descriptions in some of the rest of the scriptures. I want to encourage you to read this book and really dig into it. You can get a lot more out of it uh, besides just the time I have here to share with, with you. And so it, we see that this is a massive party. We know this party lasts 180 days, basically six months. So, you know, he's getting a chance to celebrate, to have this party, to have this banquet for 180 days with all of his leaders, all of his nobles, all of his officials to really, in a sense, show them a good time. In chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, it gives us a little insight into this party. It says that wine was served in goblets of gold, each of them different from the others, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man whatever he wished. Guys, this was a party with no restrictions, and I don't know about you, but before I became a Christian, I went to parties that I thought were with no restrictions, but they lasted one night. This was 180 days. Craziness. You can imagine, you know, the wine stewards were said, hey, give them whatever they want, as much as they want, no restrictions. So 180 days, this is going on. There's drunkenness, immorality, debauchery, no restrictions, unbridled sin for six months. You know, King Xerxes was not seeking to please a god because in that day, kings thought they were gods. And so Persia, the whole entire Persian empire was a godless empire. There was no clear focus of, of a greater power because King Xerxes thought he was that god. In fact, really, when you look at the book of Esther, you know, it can appear godless. You know, it's the only book in the Bible where there is no mention of God, not even one time. You know, no mention of prayer, no mention of angels, no reference to scripture. Uh, the only thing in there that's remotely spiritual is some fasting that they had to do. Uh, in fact, you know, when you think about this, it, it's, it's kind of representative of the culture they were in. And it was a, it was an unspiritual, it was an ungodly culture. And so a casual reading of this, you might think, well, God is silent. God's, what is God doing? In fact, you know, some critics of this book have said this book should never be in the Bible. Uh, Martin Luther, um, from back in the day, was like, hey, this book it should, never should have been canonized. There's no mention of God. It shouldn't be in there at all. And yet... If you look at the book closely, God is all through it, even though he's never mentioned one time. In Esther chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, the Bible says, On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from the wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Bitsa, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious, and he burned with anger. You know, you look at this and you go, wow, Queen Vashti, she just refused and said, I'm not going to dance and come in front of all your drunken friends. I'm not going to do that. That's ridiculous. She was unwilling to do that. And so as a result, you know, in a culture that's dominated by males, uh, he, King Xerxes was not going to be disrespected like that, especially in front of all of his leaders and nobles and officials. He wasn't going to let that go down. So he gathered a group of guys together and said, what should I do? And they said, well, hey, you gotta, you have to banish her. She cannot be your queen. She can't treat you that way. And so, you know, there you go. Queen Vashti was banished and she was stripped of her crown. Um, so they began a search for a new queen. 
So the king sent out a decree to gather all the beautiful women in the Persian Empire, as many as a thousand women. So you can imagine, he's going around through all the empire and he's gathering all you know, what is considered beautiful women. And they say there was many, historians say as many as a thousand women came together and they were brought to him to become part of the royal harem. Now Esther was a Jewish teenager uh, and she was one of those women chosen to be in King Xerxes' harem. You know, your Bible may say Hadassah, and that was just her Jewish name at birth. But she was given the name Esther, probably to hide her identity. And so, you know, that was the name that she went with. You know, she was an orphan. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai, and all the women there, um, you know, were taken to, to undergo beauty treatments. And for one year, they had to be in these beauty treatment programs. And then each of them would have an opportunity to spend a night with King Xerxes. And if he so happens to favor you, well, then you would be chosen to be his queen. And so that was kind of the goal of all thousand of those women. And yet God works through this time out of a thousand women to choose Esther. Point number one that I wanted to really think about here is that God is always working for your good. God is always working for your good. You know, Esther 2, verse 5 through 10, you know, we see that God is working for the good of his people, for the good of Esther, for the good of Mordecai. God is working in a way that even though his name is never mentioned, he's still working. In verse 5, it says, Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. We skip to verse 17. It says, Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. You know, it's an amazing story when you think about what's happening here. I mean, Mordecai said, hey, you cannot tell anybody that you are Jewish. You cannot do it. You know, again, part of the reason why she probably went with the name Esther. And so, you know, he wanted to make sure that uh, this orphan teenage girl who was probably around this time between age 14 and 15 um, would be given the greatest opportunity. And, and yes, she was. She was given an opportunity to be queen of the greatest empire in the known world. Meanwhile, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who was a Jewish official, happens to overhear a plot to assassinate King Xerxes and he courageously exposes the plot and saves King Xerxes' life. We can read about that in, in Esther 2, verse 19 through 23. It says, When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do. So she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and they conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and he told Queen Esther, who in turn reported to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded 
in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. And so we see that, uh, you know, this story is really a story of God silently and sovereignly working to save his people. God is working silently and sovereignly to save his people. There was nothing significant like parting of the Red Sea. There was no walls of Jericho falling down. There was no fire coming from heaven. There was no feeding of the 5,000. But we can't make the mistake by thinking that God isn't working in equally amazing ways to save his people from destruction. You know, God also works in the seemingly small things, in the seemingly mundane actions, day-to-day actions that you and I are involved in. And his sovereign work is often silent and it's calculated, but often unseen so that he can achieve his intended destiny in your life. God has an intended destiny for every single one of our lives. And he's working behind the scenes to work those things out so that we can live out his intended destiny for us. You know, this, in the case of Esther, begins with King Xerxes getting drunk. You know, for all of these things to happen the way that God had intended for them to happen, these steps need to take place. And I'm just going to go through a bunch of them real quick. It begins with King Xerxes getting drunk. King Xerxes has to get drunk. Not that God wants people to get drunk because he doesn't. But King Xerxes had to get drunk in order to make this ridiculous request that his queen would come and dance in front of all of his friends and all of his drunken officials. Um... And then, of course, Queen Vashti would have to say no when she probably would normally never say no. But she had to say no so that that could pave the way for her to be stripped of her crown and open up an opportunity for Esther to be crowned the new queen. Esther, of course, had to be pretty or the opportunity would never even actually present itself for her to be in this group of women. Mordecai had to be in the right place at the right time to overhear the plot against Xerxes so that Xerxes' life could be saved. You know, it had to be written that he was saved in some book somewhere so that that could be recorded for future use. You know, the king had to mistakenly forget to honor Mordecai at that actual time that Mordecai had saved his life. Haman had to deceive King Xerxes to killing the Jews and this, some of this other part we're going to be getting into over our series. But Haman had to deceive King Xerxes into killing the Jews. Esther had to be favored by Xerxes and selected as queen. God has to use Mordecai to inform Esther of this plot. Esther has to be in a position for such a time as this in order to save her people. Haman, Xerxes' official, had to hate Mordecai, which he hated him intensely. Um because Haman had to build gallows in order to hang Mordecai on, and you're not going to take the time to build, you know, gallows if indeed you really like somebody. (laughs) But he hated him, so he wanted to kill him. Xerxes' servants had to bring the chronicles of his reign, presumably to make him sleep at night, because Xerxes, you know, he was, he had insomnia, he couldn't sleep. So they had to bring him these chronicles, um, so that he could start reading these as midnight reading. And Xerxes had to read on the exact page at the exact time in the Chronicles to make him realize, hey, I forgot to honor Mordecai. Did we ever do anything for that guy? I don't think we did. We need to do something tomorrow. So in a twist of fate, Xerxes had to ask Haman to parade Mordecai around the city and show him honor for saving the king's life. And this had to happen on the exact day that Haman planned to take his life. Haman's plan, plan excuse me, had to be exposed by someone that the king loved even more than his right hand, Haman, in order to save the Jews. And Esther has to be, of course, Jewish. Because, of course, because Xerxes loved her, he'd want her to stay alive. King Xerxes, you know, has Haman killed on the very gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai. And Haman created an opportunity for a, Haman's death created an opportunity for a second in command. And Mordecai has to have won the favor of the king in order 
to take that job. And of course he did because he had saved his life. And so all of these little things, seemingly mundane things, had to happen exactly how God wanted them to happen so that he could save his people. So is this a coincidence or is this the silent sovereignty of God? There are no coincidences. This is the silent sovereignty of God at work to save his people. When God works in extraordinary ways, we see it and we're amazed. You know, the parting of the Red Sea, the walls of Jericho, the fire from heaven, all of that's inspiring and it's amazing. But when he works in ordinary ways, we might not see it. We might not get it. We might not grasp it. And yet God is working. God is working in amazing ways, silently and sovereignly working in our life. And so I want us to hear some practical lessons from this book. First of all, God works through the willing. And I really believe that, uh, you know, God is willing to work through people who are willing to be used. The book of Esther is God at work in ordinary ways, working through ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Here's an orphan willing to stand up. Mordecai was a government worker who refused to bow down to the culture, but rather exposed it for what it was. These were ordinary people being used in extraordinary ways for God. You know, God's sovereignty is always at work silently. This book tells us that God is silent even though he's never absent, that he's working for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. You know, he is working out his covenant promises. He is working out your place in his story to use you to do great things for him. He is silently working for your good, even if it looks like he's not. And I love this part also, that God doesn't care about the outward appearances. You know, there's a little slide here, uh, it's called Corona Cuts, and these are people who've cut their hair and did some crazy stuff during this time. You know, at this time, some people don't care, but most of the time, people do care, and we're obsessed with appearances in our culture. In chapter one, King Xerxes took 180 days to parade his wealth to all of the people. In chapter two, there's an international beauty pageant based on giving the most beautiful person this role of queen. In Persian culture, the most important thing for a man was to display his wealth and power. The most important thing for a woman was for her was her physical beauty and her sex appeal. So that she, and so this, so they would get a lot of beauty treatments back then. Aren't you glad that we don't live in that culture? <laughs> we do live in that culture. You know, 34 million cosmetic surgeries are done every year in the United States. $16.5 billion is spent on cosmetic surgery. Southern Cal is second only to Miami in these procedures. For all the superficial differences that, you know, that, that we see from then to now, the world is really not that much different. And the world tells us that outward appearances are everything. What you have matters more than who you are. Beauty, money, talent, connections, you know, credentials. This is the way to success. People are in massive debt, hoping to fake it until they make it. Massive amounts of money is spent on beauty treatments, trying to fit into this world. And God is telling us through the book of Esther, it's exhausting and it's hollow and there's something better. There's something more meaningful, something more deep, something that can be transformative, that can be transformative for other people if you will simply step up and live out God's plan for your life. The question you have to ask yourself is if we become compliant to the ways of the world. Esther becomes queen because of her beauty and her compliance. She did not stand up and this is where some of her critics say she didn't stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when she went into this new culture. She didn't stand up like them. She didn't stand up like Daniel. She didn't do these things. And you know what? The fact is, is she didn't. She didn't stand up. But she began to realize that God was trying to do something better with her life. And although that, you know, she had sex with King Xerxes before she was married, you know, and then when she did get married, she married a non-Christian. You know, all those things are true, and, and, and you can't deny that those were facts. But that is not where she landed. That's where she began. You know, it's always easier to point the finger at someone else than to really look at your own life. The truth is, Esther did start out being compliant to the world. 
she did have a rough start. But she began to see that real beauty was something much deeper than that. That man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Her real beauty was her courage to lay down her life and her heart to save her people. Her real beauty was her willingness to listen to her cousin Mordecai, even when she didn't understand everything he was saying. Her real beauty was her security to do the right thing at the right time in a most difficult situation so that God's people could be saved. You know, I don't know where your start is in your Christian life. I don't know where you are today, but you don't have to stay there. God wants to use you in great ways. God wants to use you for greater purposes, but we got to be willing to step in and be willing to step up and be the men and women that God wants us to be. Titus 2 verse 11 and 12 says that God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live upright and godly lives. You know, that is what Esther does. She she's, makes a decision to say no to ungodliness, to step up, and she was willing to give up her beauty treatment. She was willing to give up her crown. She was willing to give up all the things that the world had to offer so that she could do what God had offered her to do. What has God offered you to do? What situation do you need to step up in today? God wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use all of us. And he doesn't care about your past. He wants you to have an amazing future. But he wants you to trust that he's secretly and sovereignly working in your life. You know, the Bible tells us that God is patient and he doesn't treat us what our sins deserve. In Romans 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, Esther initially did not live up to the image that we've come to expect for heroes. Not initially. Yet she does get there. And we don't always live up to the life that Christ called us to live. But God is patient and he knows that if we stay faithful, if we stay in him, that we can live out his intended destiny for our life. You know, we see God taking Esther quietly and gently by the hand and guiding her through her spiritual journey. You know, putting Mordecai in her life to help her patiently shaping, molding, and preparing her to reach her intended destiny. God, in his silent sovereignty, never gave up on Esther. And God will never, ever give up on you. As we prepare for communion today, I want us to think about the cross. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus died while we were still sinners and that he was willing to die so that we could live this life that he's called us to live. The cross is proof that Jesus will never, ever give up on us. And he demonstrated his love by dying on the cross so that you and I could stand and rise up and live victoriously in the silent sovereignty of God.
My name is Chris Parker, and my wife and I are part of the marriage here in Central Orange County. I have the opportunity to share a few thoughts about offering this morning. A few weeks ago, I ran across a meme about our life in the pandemic, and it basically goes like this. We need to stop saying that we're all in the same boat. That's not true. We're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And that's very true. Some of us are working from home, while others are wondering if or when we'll be able to get back to work. Some are trying to figure this out with kids at home, and some aren't. Each of our circumstances and challenges is very different, and this applies to our giving during a pandemic. One of the things that I love and appreciate about God is that he meets us where we're at. A Second Corinthians 8.12 reads, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I like that. God doesn't want us comparing little numbers on a pieces of paper. He just wants us to be willing to do what we're able to. And I'm really appreciative that we have this time to really be able to, to think about that and an opportunity to uh, give back to God. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to be able to uh, give to your church, to be able to supply the needs uh, of our staff and the ministry and everything that goes uh, into uh, making our church uh, a family that it is. I'm so grateful for the impact that we've already had on our community and look forward to uh, seeing how you're going to continue to work through us during this challenging time. God, we love you and pray this in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
This is Kids Church News. I'm Haley reporting from my home studio today's top story. Currently, COVID-19 has come into the world and has derailed many plans and social distancing has been established. But according to our greatest source, the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Bible also makes it clear that Jesus loves the children. So, for the children, God has a special adventure for you. It will be faith-filled and mountains of fun, and it's arriving this summer. It is called Vacation Bible School, also known as VBS. And this summer's theme for VBS is Rocky Railway, with a special message that Jesus' power pulls us through. Quite a relevant message for today. Now, this is not going to be your normal VBS. This VBS is coming straight to your home. It is an online version for an at-home experience. It will be filled with songs, Bible lessons, fun, and more for the whole family. We have a reporter on location to fill us in with more information on the arrival of Rocky Railway. Over to you, Cece. Thank you, Haley. And yes, that is right. Rocky Railway will be arriving in Orange County Friday, July 3rd. This online at-home BBS will air on Facebook and YouTube at 6 p.m. and will continue to make stops every Friday in July for the viewing in the comfort of your home for the whole family to experience. It's being called Friday Family Nights with Rocky Railway. At Rocky Railway, kids will explore Jesus' power and how we trust him to pull us through life's challenges. Here's a young girl. Hello. Are you excited for Phoebe Young? Yeah. You heard it here. Kids everywhere are excited for Friday Family Nights with Rocky Railway. It will be mountains of fun for children and parents with a special message that Jesus' power pulls us through. Reporting live, from my home, I'm Cece. Back to you in the home studio, Haley. Thank you, Cece, and excellent reporting. Registration for Rocky Railway will open soon. This registration will include fun train track packs for the children that contain hands-on gizmos that will go along with each Friday's Bible lesson. CDs and music downloads will also be available for purchase. Please stay tuned with our social media outlets for more information. It is estimated that many families will stay on track with Jesus this summer through Friday Family Nights with Rocky Railway. So, all aboard! <laughs> it's full steam ahead. From all of us here, thank you and have a great day. Bye! Bye. Hi, I'm Charlie and I live here in the central part of OC and it's been a really great time worshiping together with all of you virtually and starting our new series on Esther called for such a time as this. And if you would like to continue to stay connected, please follow us on our Facebook page, our Instagram, or you could subscribe to our YouTube channel or simply um, look us up on the website occhurchofchrist.com and no need to worry we will be back next week live streaming our kids church starting at 9 30 and our regular service at 10 a.m i do have a special prayer request that if we could please continue to pray for our members that have really serious health challenges they need our prayers please continue to pray for them and their families we want them to feel the love and comfort of god but also his church. So um, my other announcement is that we have a really special opportunity to give uh, in a really special way on June 14th, which is what we call our uh, annual special contribution. So please keep that on your calendars and we really look forward to that um, on June 14th. So afterwards, we have a really great opportunity to fellowship in our Zoom calls. And if you're not connected to a Zoom fellowship and discussion group, please message us and we can get you hooked up with one. And along with that, if you are visiting with us and you're interested in studying the Bible to learn more about God and his love for you, we would love to study with you 
um, through a Zoom Bible study. It's one of the things we uh, love the most. So please message us and we can get you hooked up with that also. So until next week, have a really wonderful week. And remember that we serve an amazing, awesome, powerful, and loving God. See you then.